Hi, I'm Matt Culkin. I co-chair Steptoe's Financial Service Practice Group. And welcome to another course in our Financial Services University. Today, we're going to talk about the extraterritorial application of U.S. criminal law. And I'm thrilled to introduce you to my partner, Jim Broshin. Uh, Jim's a, a, a litigator based in our New York office who handles complex white collar and criminal cases. Uh, he's got a 30 year track record of success representing companies and individuals in all sorts of cross border matters before the Department of Justice, the SEC, the CFTC and other law enforcement agencies. So, Jim, first, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So, so Jim, I, I want to kind of drill right down to the, to the key takeaway now. But what should companies keep in mind when they're thinking about sort of the extraterritorial reach of U.S. criminal law? for individuals or executives or companies doing business outside the U.S.? Sure, Matt. There, there are really two primary ways that uh, U.S. law can apply to conduct that takes place overseas. Uh, the first is whether the particular law in question has language or has an explicit provision that says that it applies to conduct abroad. And the classic examples there are the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, the FCPA, that uh, many people are familiar with, and the anti-money laundering statute is, is another one. Those are, there's explicit language in those laws that it can apply uh, to conduct outside the U.S. Um, but the other way, which not everybody is aware of, is if the conduct um, at issue is the focus of, of, well, let me put it this way, if the focus of the statute in question is uh, occurs in the U.S., that can uh, trigger U.S. jurisdiction, and it is, it's viewed very broadly by the DOJ. And the classic example there is that uh, someone transits money uh, by electronically, by wire, uh, communicates via email or telephone, it has been deemed by the U.S. courts that if those um, communications pass through the U.S. even briefly, milliseconds, um, then that is enough to create uh, U.S. jurisdiction. The, there's a recent case that's been in the news um, that I think illustrates this idea, and that's the case of uh, Sabrina or Wenzhou uh, Meng, the CFO of uh, Huawei, the Chinese telecom company, and the uh, she reached, recently reached a resolution of her case with the U.S. authorities, and the jurisdictional hook there was simply that some of the payments in question um, uh, passed through the U.S. branch of Huawei's uh, bank, uh, even though the bank itself was based in Hong Kong, and that was deemed enough to trigger U.S. jurisdiction in that case. So that's really interesting, and that's a, that's a great example. So. As we've talked about this, you know, I was surprised at how expansive the reach of U.S. criminal law can be. I mean, from a, even just from a pure geographic perspective, and so it seems like you know businesses, executives, individuals really need to think about the risks that may be posed and and sort of assess the activities that they're conducting, even if there's not that that direct connection to the United States. I think that's that's absolutely right, um, and it it comes up for uh, non-U.S. companies uh, that are conducting business abroad in two broad ways. Um, the first is whether um, conduct that uh, they're engaged in it can be investigated uh, by the U.S. authorities, principally the. Justice Department, but not always the Justice Department. And then um, second, whether U.S. Uh, authorities can compel the production of evidence uh, that is located abroad in connection with an investigation uh, into those activities. With regard to the first category, um, an investigation, there's unlikely to be any kind of court uh, ruling or, or, or something like that available to curtail the jurisdiction. So really the only constraint is the Justice Department's own view of what, what is legitimate. And given uh, recent examples, that's not much of a constraint 
at all. Um, and similarly, in the area of um, efforts to compel the production of um, evidence, documents, emails, those sorts of things that's located abroad, um, there are some limits on that, but the trend in this area as well is towards ever more expansive um, uh, view of U.S. jurisdiction, including a, a, a law that Congress passed uh, earlier this year, which uh, expanded even more and, uh, for example, used uh, the presence of correspondent uh, bank accounts as a lever, uh, so to speak, in order to gain access to any bank document uh, related to the investigation, even if that document has no relation to the correspondence, uh, correspondent account itself, uh, and even if that document or those documents are located abroad. So I'm, I'm curious, I mean, it, it seems to be a, a trend where the reach of the, of the U.S. law enforcement system is growing, but are there, in fact, any limits on U.S. criminal law and, and the reach outside our borders? Well, yes, but fewer than you might think. Um, U.S. courts we frequently make statements about uh, U.S. law governs domestically but does not rule the world and, and, and things of that sort. Um, but there, in practical terms, there really are very few limits, and uh, at least in part uh, because the limits that exist are often not put to the test. Companies and individuals agree, either through negotiation or otherwise, um, to produce evidence or to uh, allow themselves to be uh, subjected to investigation without testing those limits. So uh, the reality is that companies need to assume for planning and risk purposes that in almost all cases, let's, let's say most cases, that uh, U.S. authorities would have uh, jurisdiction to investigate. So I'll, I'll let you go after this, but if you look into your crystal ball, do you see this trend changing in the future? Um, not in not in the uh, uh, slightest. Uh, I think it's um, uh, for for whatever reason, most likely the increasing globalization of the world economy. Um, U.S. authorities have uh, continued to look uh, abroad uh, as part of their uh, investigative uh, mandate, and I see no reason why they uh, will not do so even more in the future. And what companies and individuals can do is really be prepared and, and assume that um, their activities their business activities are subject to um, uh, U.S. investigative authority. And as a result, they should shore up their compliance programs, their anti-money laundering programs, and those things to, to make sure they're up to date and up to the standards that uh, U.S. authorities would expect from, from a company that uh, fell within its jurisdiction. And that's a perfect plug, Jim. Thanks for mentioning that for our other Financial Services University courses on some of those topics. So that does it for another episode of Steptoe's Financial Services University. Today we talked about the extraterritorial reach of U.S. law enforcement. I hope you'll check out our other episodes at steptoe.com. And Jim, thanks for joining. We'll see you all next time. Great. Thanks for having me.